All right, guys, we're going live. Just trying to get everything set up. Give us time for everybody to get here. Dun, dun, dun. Let's see what we got. Scroll down. There we are. No, oh, and we're sideways. So let me fix that. Trying to get everything situated. I got a new toy in the mail this morning. It's a uh, phone stand tripod. And of course, I'm going to get clay all over it, but Sideways? What does that look like? Nope. Let's fix that. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry for the ride, guys. All right. I want to see our comments. Mitchell's here. All right. going. Washed my clay towel the other day and promptly got more clay all over it last night when I was making my pieces. All right. So, welcome. Um, this is my third live stream for 171 and I thought I'd do another wheel and what I wanted to make was an ice cream goblet. So, I actually have examples to show you. These are some that I I made with one of our summer teen groups over a couple years ago, I think. So essentially an ice cream goblet, that's, that's what I'm calling it. You could certainly use this for whatever you might want, but um, it's, it's great for ice cream. <laughs> it's really just a, a bowl on a pedestal, so I throw this all as one piece and I'm going to tilt you guys up just a little bit so you can actually see my face. There we go. Um, so I throw this as one piece. We do the bowl and I kind of segment it and make the foot and then I hollow the foot out a little bit deeper than you typically would. And then you have elevated elegance something snazzy for your ice cream. This one's a little bit bigger, a little bit beefier. So I usually get this one. Matt usually gets this one. <laughs> um, again, nice and deep in the bottom. Um, and what I see is kind of the challenge with these is getting that interior shape to, to work really well. For a spoon, you don't really want it to like get caught on anything. It should be nice and smooth with a, a, a U-curve. There shouldn't be any steps inside. And the, the other important part is compressing. So I don't know if you guys can see, but this one inside has just like a, a small S crack. It doesn't actually leak, so we still use it. Uh, we just gotta make sure we clean it really well so it goes in the dishwasher, but um, we'll spend some time looking at how to compress really well and Hopefully, I'll go through the actual throwing, and I made a couple yesterday so that I could show you what trimming looks like. And I think they'll be ready. They're, they're a little tacky, um, but we'll make our way through it and see how it works. So, I have about uh, two and a half pounds. I didn't really weigh it. 
I would say a grapefruit's worth of clay. You know how I like to compare to fruit. So a grapefruit is probably enough. We can always trim more off if we need to. I, I was playing with kind of the amounts of clay that I used yesterday and I ended up using a little bit too much. So we can always trim that off. It's just better to have more than you need. That way you can trim it off. That's, that's easier than adding the clay back to it. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Amanda. I'm the ceramics technician at 171 and one of the instructors. And we're in my basement studio that was created because we're working from home. <laughs> so I've been slowly accumulating tools and things to organize the space and um, it's getting there. You know, it's, it's fairly functional, so that's kind of nice. <laughs> Good motivator to get things done. So we might as well get started. Um, I'm going to continue to kind of check the feed of comments and things. So if I miss you, I'll go back in our comments and hopefully address some questions at the end. Um, but I want to get my nice ball of clay ready. I'm going to tilt the camera down in just a second so that you guys can see actually what my hands are doing and I'll just kind of narrate as we're going. So it doesn't have to be a perfect ball, but we want it to be round-ish. You want to avoid any um, deep divots or finger marks. So I like to use the palm of my hand to do that clay pounding. And I'm using wood fire clay because it's good to build up a stock of things for us to fire later on when we do our next firing, which may not be until the fall, um, but we'll just store things indefinitely until we have our wood fire. I can also use these in the raku firing, but because I want this to be a functional thing, I'm probably not going to put it in the raku firing because raku stuff isn't food safe, depending on who you ask. If we were in the East, in China or Japan, they would say it's food safe. But um, Western tradition with Raku is, is typically not a food safe practice. All right, so let's tilt you down just so you can see kind of what's going on. Hope that kind of works. Sorry, guys. Okay, I think I fixed it. Sorry, guys. That's what happens when I touch my phone. Okay. Better. Alright, let's throw this guy down, get this centered. Sometimes it doesn't stick, so I like to give it a couple more wax to make sure it's really on there. Get my water. Get my towel going. So I'm going to center this up. You want to make sure you have your arms kind of locked in tight. For me, sitting on this uh, kick wheel, it's a little bit different posture than if I were on our typical electric wheels. So I've found that if I brace my arm on the splash pan, this big bowl, that I get a little bit more stability. So I really like to use the palm and squishy part of my thumb to do this centering part. And I just continuously push the clay away from me and that helps get it to the center. And as I do this, depending on where my pressure points are, we'll make the clay go upwards and do that coning process, which is helpful to warm your clay up, um, get your muscles ready to work with the clay and to work out any air bubbles that might be in your clay. This stuff is fresh from the bag, so that shouldn't really be an issue, but if I was redoing a piece or recycling some clay that had been used for something else, the centering and coning process is a little bit more important then because you might have worked a bubble in there. So we wanna make sure to get those out. So those lead to explosions later on and coning helps to counteract that. It's not foolproof, but it does a pretty decent job of it. So I do this a couple of times. Um, in art school, there were kind of like random 
parameters that we were given. You should wet your clay 50 times, and then when you put it on the wheel, it, you should cone it up 10 times. It's kind of arbitrary. <laughs> um, I don't really adhere to hard and fast rules like that. So when I feel like it, it's centered and the clay feels right to me, it's soft and, and plastic, movable, that's when I know that it, it's good to go. So I just have my foot right on my um, motor pedal. This is its top speed, essentially. Um, those of you working on electric wheels, you'd still want to go up to that top speed. Let some of the physics of the wheel spinning help you get your clay centered. Um, doing it faster makes it easier. You still want to maintain control, so you don't want to go faster than you're comfortable with, but you also don't want to go at a snail's pace either, because that'll just make it tricky to do. <laughs> 50 times, Martha, yeah. It's a, it's a bit excessive in my viewpoint. All right, so I'm gonna bring this back down. I feel pretty confident with where it's at. I just can kind of continuously wipe my hands off. I like to clean my bat before I do the next step, so I use the short part of this rub, not rubber, wooden rib and just scrape, so this can make a noise in just a second. That just gets rid of that clay that's on the bottom of the bat that's not really doing much of anything. So this is a, a typical hockey puck shape. Um, this is pretty traditional for when you're starting just about anything on the wheel to bring your clay down to this kind of configuration. If we were making a plate, it'd be wider and flatter, but because we want to get some height with this, I don't want to bring it all the way down. So I'm going to make my center hole. I'm going to open it up with my thumbs. I like to overlap them. And again, I kind of want to tuck my elbow in, make sure it's supported so that my fingers don't go off track. My thumb is the strongest finger I have and I like to overlap so that I can drill straight down. Some people prefer to use um, their pointer and their index finger. That's fine too. But now that I have this open, or the hole started, I'm going to open it more. Now for this, because we want there to be a bowl and for a pedestal at the bottom, I don't want to go as deep as I typically would if I were making this just as a bowl. So I've only gone about halfway down and I'm going to kind of take some time to work on that interior space to do some of that compression that is pretty important with this type of vessel. So you can do this with a sponge. I start with the sponge and then eventually I'll, I'll transition to doing this with the rubber rib to get in there. Because remember, if you use your sponge too much, um, you may pull out the grog that's in your clay and it will be coarse and not smooth. So you want to be careful about using it too much. So now I'm just going to kind of straighten up these walls so that I can get ready to pull. I'm going to give myself kind of a ridge down here as a boundary so that I don't pull from all the way at the bottom. I'm going to only pull from this ridge up because I want to leave clay down there for the pedestal part. So I want that ridge to be pretty close to where the bottom of my interior section is. That'll take a little bit of adjusting. It's kind of hard to tell from this perspective, this bird's eye view, of how far down that hole goes and where that outside shape is. So I think this is pretty close. We'll adjust it as we go. So I'm pushing mostly with my outside hand. My inside hand is kind of just following along. It's something for my sponge hand to push against. I want to do this a little bit at a time. I'm not trying to get all of my height in one go. And I have more pressure down at the bottom than I do at the top. The top wants to thin itself out. That's the first part that gets the thinnest. So if 
you can back your pressure off, you can prevent the rim from getting too thin and from losing it. That can also lead to it getting um, off balance and you end up with like this high-low thing going on on your rim, which eventually means you have to trim it off. So let's try doing that some more. I really like to pull with my sponge. I feel like it just helps my fingers kind of diffuse the pressure so that I don't end up with really pronounced throwing rings, which are kind of those ridges that you can see, maybe, maybe you can see them, lightly on the surface there. So I've got my height kind of built up, but now that's going to kind of go away as I stretch this out and open it as a bowl. But just like pulling, I don't want to make this too wide too quickly. So I put my hand right on the inside and I've gone just about down to the bottom of where that hole is. And I'm pulling my fingers, I'm pulling the fingers on the inside back towards my belly so that I can help to stretch this out. And I'm moving those fingers up the side of the walls so that I can kind of distribute that pressure. So we're gonna do that again. Still trying to find my rhythm with this kick wheel. It's, it's considerably different than just the electric wheel, which I've kind of gotten spoiled on. That definitely has a lot more finesse with the speed control. But kick wheel is kind of helpful. A little bit more advantageous when you're trimming. So we'll see what that looks like in a couple minutes. So the, the ones that I've made, I really try and keep as uh, a U-shaped profile on the inside of the bowl. I just like that shape. I think it works well for the function of scooping with a spoon and I, I like the way it looks. You could go for more of a V shape. I was trying to think of other names for what to call this. You might call it like a parfait dish, um, a dessert cup. I'm just partial to ice cream. And the next time I'm in Corning, I made a trip out there last week to pick some things up at the studio and to put things on the shelf that students had dropped off, but hopefully I'll go on a day other than Monday so that I can pick up some Dippity Doodah's ice cream. They're still selling stuff and doing uh, alleyway pickups, and <laughs> They keep posting all of their flavors. It's making me very hungry because we're approaching full ice cream season. So I thought this was kind of an appropriate time to show you what this looks like. We've been subsisting ourselves on Perry's ice cream, which is great. Um, but, you know, the homemade stuff that's local, more local than Perry's, um, is pretty excellent. So right now I'm just kind of working on that interior shape, taking my time going back and forth with my sponge and kind of compressing this as I go. I'm trying not to add too much water on the inside. That's something that I was kind of struggling with yesterday when I was making my pieces ahead of time. but. I think I got, got back into doing it because I haven't made these in a while. So I had to remind myself what needed to happen. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and squeeze in this uh, pedestal of clay down here so that it's not quite so wide. And it'll hopefully kind of push this upwards as well. I'm going to use my sponge for this and I'm just going to push this in. So the trick that I, 
I need to keep in mind, I guess it's not really a trick, the characteristic that I need to keep in mind is the wider the bowl, the wider the, the base needs to be, just for balance. Um, I don't want this to be topsy-turvy and, and tip over because nobody likes when ice cream spills out. That's just sad. <laughs> so we want to make sure that this is stable. So I don't want to go in too far. And some of the shape work will have to be done when I trim because if I make this too thin now, it's also susceptible to kind of going wonky. And you can see that it's not spinning quite as centered as it was because I'm pushing that clay at the bottom. It makes whatever's above it go a little bit, a little bit wonky. So I'm going to establish that thinner spot, kind of the spot where you're going to grab onto it. And because I pushed that in, that's changed the interior shape of my bowl, so I need to adjust that. There's lots of back and forth with this that I've found. Like you adjust a little bit on the outside and then you have to go back and adjust the inside. Back and forth, back and forth. So take your time with it. Be patient. If you go too quickly, you will mess it up. <laughs> I'm sure we all kind of are familiar with that. It's one of the hardest things with clay is knowing when to stop and what your limits are. I usually refer to it as the Goldilocks scenario. You want to make sure that you're not pushing too hard, but you also can't push too, too few, too, well, too less. <laughs> Oh, you want to find that in-between sweet spot, just right. I'm going to push this bottom out a little bit so it's more bowl shaped. And this is kind of a warm-up activity for something that we're hoping to show you next week maybe Saturday. We're not totally set on the date quite yet, but um, initially I was going to do a, like an actual chalice and goblet today, but uh, Mitchell came up with a good idea and he suggested that to make that a true showdown, throwdown challenge, we should have our other instructors kind of doing it at the same time. So what we're hoping is that we can live stream together all making a chalice or goblet, whatever you might want to call it, and the challenge is going to be called the quarantine cup. <laughs> so some of my students and I were texting back and forth a couple weeks ago and um, Jeff and Alan came up with this idea to challenge ourselves by making a goblet and we're pretty open to whatever parameters we want, the one stipulation that we kind of made was that it has to be less than 20 pounds. So that's kind of a, a wide breadth of uh, possibilities. And not all of us have wheels at home, so there will be some hand-built ones. So we thought it would be cool to kind of see that in person on a live stream and to get me kind of in the right mindset for that to happen, I thought doing an ice cream goblet might be a good way to start. And it worked out that I actually have examples of it at home with me, so that's fortuitous as well. So I'm just going to take a little bit of time to kind of work on the pedestal part of this. And what I like to do is use one of my wooden tools. I have one that looks like this. It's modified. This end ended, ended up getting cracked. It's usually more of a round end. Um, so it's been sanded down, but it's excellent for kind of getting right underneath the lip of the clay down there. So now that it's lifted up off of the bat, I can actually kind of snug my sponge up right underneath it and make it more of a pedestal foot. Could 
get extra fancy with this. Maybe you have lots of um, steps and segments on your, your pedestal foot. Or um, maybe it's more simplistic and kind of just a tapered cone shape to hold this up. Where you can play around with it. But you do want to remember that you're going to trim this later on so you can save some of that shaping and that detail work for the trimming part, which can be a little bit more advantageous. But when we flip this over, we're not going to really be able to see this flat part very well. So I'm going to try and put a little bit more detail into it now so that I don't have to turn myself upside down to trim it and see what I'm doing. The other option that you could go with is once you have this thrown, maybe you do some hand carving decoration on it or some glaze decoration later on down the road once you get this fired. There's lots of options. Let's try this one. So just using this curved end of a tool to lift that back up. Try that again. So with my sponge underneath that little skirt, and it's created more of an upturned ridge, which I kind of like the looks of. change that shape a little bit. Okay, so I need to follow my own advice and not play with this too much. <laughs> so let's try and get to our finishing touches. I'm going to use this rubber rib. This is a Mud Tools um, flexible rib. This is the, like the baby size and then this is the next size up. I'm going to use the baby one just because it's a little bit easier to, to work with in this kind of enclosed space. So just like when I compressed earlier with the sponge in my fingertips, the rib can really help do that too, while also smoothing any of that rough, groggy stuff that might be at the bottom of your piece. And you do want to take time to kind of smooth that out because it's going to be easier to clean once this is a finished thing. If it's coarse in there, kind of hold on to a lot of icky germs. Glaze may cover it up, but sometimes glaze doesn't. So I want to make sure that I don't have to really worry about it later on and just take, take a minute to smooth it out. I'm also going to do that on the outside of my goblet. Help smooth it out. Maybe you want more of the, the throwing ring texture. You could leave that in there. Maybe you add some more visual interest with texture later on. Um, the other thing that I want to look at is my rim. So because I'm probably going to be clinking a spoon against this, metal and ceramic, we want to make sure that this is kind of robust. So I'm using a piece of leather chamois with my bobber so it doesn't get lost in my uh, water bucket. And I just lightly put this over the rim with a little bit of downward pressure. Um, so this helps to thicken the rim and it's compressing it just like I did in the bottom so that it is more resilient and stronger. And when I do this, I like to turn out mostly with bowls, and this kind of is a bowl, um, turn out the rim just a little bit. Now if this were a regular bowl, this would enable it to be stacked later on in a cupboard without having to actually measure things because it's not um, tapered so that bowls could get stuck inside of it. When it has that flare, it's just a, a little bit easier to store in the cupboard. And I like the way it looks. Also, it gives it just a little bit of a defined lip. So if you were to lick your bowl, depending on how good your ice cream is or, you know, kind of slurp slurp it out, that's kind of a, a nice feeling shaped rib 
rim to put your lips on. Um, so that's something that we got to think about too. I'm going to do just a little bit more compression with my sponge on the base here because that looked a little bit wonky to me. just a little bit more. I'm going to use the curved end and kind of scoop some of this clay out. You could also use your finger. That works well. So I don't know about you guys, but we have lots of rain here today. Gray and kind of gloomy. It was super windy yesterday. It was windy throughout the night, too. Now it's just wet. A little bit more in there. The other thing you want to make sure is that there aren't any puddles on the inside of your piece. Any residual water that might be in there will start to dissolve your clay and weaken it, and that can also lead to the S-crack that I showed you earlier in that, that finished piece. So you want to scoop any of that out, soak it up with your sponge or your rib, and then you're kind of good to go. Let me pull this off, give you a good look at that. Lifting the bottom up too also helps for when you're going to wire this off. This gives it a starting point to get your wire in there so that you don't cut it off unevenly, because that can be kind of annoying to deal with after this dries and you're ready to trim. So I like lifting it up a little bit um, just by undercutting it. So those wooden tools are helpful for that. So let me put this aside for now and we'll try trimming one. We've got some time left. Um, they're gonna be a little bit sticky. Let me see what we got. All right. Got a wheel from the studio. No, a bat from the studio. It's a little bit stiff to fit on these bat pins. Let's see. Sometimes you gotta give it a little bit of a whack to get it stuck on there because it's nice and tight. All right. Wipe my hands off. This is kind of a dirty bat, so let me give it a quick wipe down. I don't want this stuff to stick to my piece that I'm going to trim, um, and I don't want it to really distort the clay either, so I'm going to just use my towel and dry that off. give these guys a feel and see which one is the better candidate. Pull these over. So I flipped them upside down this morning so that the bases could start to dry. Now this was the first one that I made and it has more of um, a V interior rather than a, a smooth U curve which is okay. Um, what ended up happening is I went down further than I really should have when I opened this up. So it has a little bit of that staircase in there. But if you like melty ice cream, that would be a good feature to have in there. So you have a little pool of melted goodness at the bottom if you want. That one might be what we have to trim. So I wanna make sure that to trim stuff, the rims have dried, those are, are fairly stable, but this base is still kind of tacky. Um, it's, sticking to my fingers and I'm leaving fingerprints on it. So that tells me that it's not quite ready. And if I were to trim it now, it's gonna clog my tool up with all of that damp clay. Especially as I remove clay from trimming, it's going to get damper on the inside, which means stickier. So I am going to try this smaller one. And keep in mind, you don't wanna to go too small with things because your clay is gonna shrink. And I don't know about you, but I need at least two scoops of ice cream for it to you know, really be worthwhile. So <laughs> if you make it too small, you're only gonna really end up with a scoop 
which is kind of the limitation to this one that I I had made before. Um, I think this is a more realistic <laughs> high as an expectation. We could go with um, the diet bowl or the I've had a hard day and I need ice cream bowl. So there, there are your options. Before I get this um, stuck down there, I want to check my depth. So I have my finger on the inside, feeling how deep it is with a finger on the outside to kind of gauge where it is thinnest. And which is typically the case with most pieces, the middle is where it is the thinnest. And I have a good amount of clay out here and then I have less here because that's where um, I kind of flattened it out. So there's bulky clay right in this kind of midsection that I'll, I'll need to focus on. So I can't be too aggressive with it, um, but I can also take a little bit of clay out from this section here, which was a little hard to, to shape when I was throwing it. So I can do a little bit of trimming at that section too. So I don't think I've shown you guys trimming quite yet. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, we have to do this annoying part to get it centered. This takes a little bit of time, but it is important to do because if your piece isn't centered, you're gonna trim it off kilter and it's gonna be uneven. So it takes, takes some time. Um, because I don't really have a side to work on, I'm gonna be doing this top method of trying to center it. So I've eyeballed it and put it on the back. Um, and I'm just gonna use my foot to kind of spin this around. This is where a kick wheel is helpful. I'm gonna use my pin tool to scribe a circle on there. So my circle is not centered because the piece is not centered. To get it closer to being centered, I wanna take the side that has the most amount of clay. So from that drawn circle to the edge, I have a thicker part here and it's a little bit thinner on the other side. So I put that thick spot right in front of me and I'm gonna give it a little bit of a push away just a little bit to move it and I'm gonna try that again this is a incremental process which is is why it's kind of annoying and frustrating but again important so I'm gonna use my pen tool just again lightly on the surface draw that line I rub out my lines because if I keep them there I get confused as to which one I just just made so it looks a little bit thicker on that section over here than over there. And again, I'm just eyeballing this. Um, there is a skill that I'm trying to practice myself because it looks like a magic trick, but um, some people can tap center their piece. So they have their wheel spinning and they just tap on the piece and then it aligns itself to center. And I can't do that. So I'm gonna have to practice with just like a leftover can, I'll put some clay in it and I'll, I'll practice tap centering. Because I have not found any real helpful video online of, of people really explaining how they do it. Some people tap, tap quickly, some people tap just like three times and their wheel is spinning very slowly. Um, it's one of those mysterious pottery skills. I've not mastered that yet. And then the other thing we have to keep in mind when we're centering something, that looks pretty good to me. Um, I am centering it based on the bottom. That does not mean that the rim is also centered. If you've thrown something that is not centered to begin with, it's gonna be very difficult to center it again when you are trimming. So we really need to judge it based on the information that we're getting from the clay on the section that we're working on. If you're judging it by the rim, that may not match up with your foot. So kind of ignore this, the part down here because that's not really what we're, we're focusing on. So next you're gonna use um, some wads of clay, they're called lugs. Um, they wanna be, need them to be still soft and moldable, but they shouldn't be sticky. And I'm gonna push them down to tamp, 
tamp down my piece so that it doesn't move. You need your piece to be centered before you can do this. Otherwise, what's, what's the point? You've got to be able to move it. So I usually go with six. Um, some people will do more of like a log and they'll do three or four of them. Um, some people also trim on a foam bat instead of a plastic bat. That works too and then you don't need the lugs. But I don't really need to trim down here so I'm not too worried about it. So I like to apply two of them at kind of the same time. So in case I push it, I don't totally misalign it and get it out of center. So you gotta push down and then kind of push lightly, mush this inward. You don't wanna push too hard, otherwise you're gonna distort your rim, especially if that's still soft. So I wanna make sure that doesn't move. I give it a good kind of push to make sure it's stuck. And then I'm going to use these tools to trim. Um, so this is better for smaller details. I may need to use this. This is kind of the typical sized one. It's got a square end, a round end, and then this is a little bit bigger. Um, I borrowed these ones from the studio. I have a trim tool. Um, this is what I used in college, but I don't know if you can see the difference in thickness of this part. This one is considerably more worn down than this one. So this is sharper, and that's why I wanna use this one. Um, when you have a dull tool, it just kind of pulls your clay instead of actually cutting it. So you wanna make sure that your tool is sharp, and you can just use a, a regular file for that. All right, so I don't really want to reduce the diameter. I'm, I'm really just kind of focusing on making it less heavy by trimming out this center part and I know that I have a lot of clay in the midsection not so much on the edge or in the middle so I'm gonna use the square end I tend to just default to that I'm gonna just drag it straight across and help level this out it's not unlevel but it's kind of a good habit to develop when you're you're throwing or trimming in case you've cut it off unevenly. So I'm going to trim out the middle. You gotta remember I can't go too deep there. But I can be a little bit more aggressive in this midsection. So they are coming off in ribbons, which is good. That tells me that my tool is sharp. But they're a little bit more damp than I would normally like. So if I had given this piece a couple more hours or if I had kind of dried it out with a hair dryer or a heat gun or a fan, it would be a little bit more um, ready for this trimming part. I'm gonna switch to my round end piece. Now, the thing that everyone is fearful of when they're trimming is trimming through the bottom. So I need to be really careful not to go down too deeply. And just like I compressed on the inside of my piece when I was throwing it, I'm gonna do the same thing with this trimming, which is actually pretty important because I'm trimming this while it is damp. And that's when kind of compression cracks can develop. So I really wanna be careful about that. So this is a little bit different than trimming just a regular bowl um, because I'm going deeper. But this is when we can get rid of some of that bulk. I also want to be mindful that if this gets top heavy, it's going to tip over so I can't take too much off of it. And this is what I'm talking about. It's kind of sticking to itself in there. That tells me that it, it's a little bit wetter than it really should be. Um, so that's it slows you down. You got to stop and kind of clean your tool off and clean off the part that you're trimming. Okay, let's do some of that compressing. Oops, lost the pin tool. Alright. 
trimming does work better when you're going faster. Medium speed is fine too, but when you go slow, that is going to bring out every surface flaw on your piece. So if you have an uneven spot, your tool is going to find that and it's going to accentuate it. So um, I like to think of it as like a washerboard road, something that is a dirt road that's gotten kind of washed out and has all of those bumps and ridges on it. Do you go fast over them so that you don't go into the bumps or do you go slow so that you don't break your front end suspension? Um, for clay, you want to go fast so that your tool just kind of skates right over those flaws and doesn't go into the hills and valleys that might be on the surface of your piece if it's uneven. So I'm using my rib to flatten this out. Because this is so soft, my finger can actually do a lot of this polishing and kind of burnishing compression that I need it to. Now I'm not making this quite as deep as I have with the ones that I've made in the past because I made the inside a little bit too deep. But if you have a more substantial pedestal, then you can be a little bit more aggressive with taking that clay off. Use that chamois a little bit. I'm not trying to introduce more water per se, but the dampness can help to do that burnishing, smoothing it out. Round off the side. So this is kind of bringing us to the end. Um, I hope that was kind of fun to watch. We're really trying to, to figure out how to get clay classes up and going. Um, I think we're probably going to end up starting with more of demo classes. And if you have stuff at home, that's great. You can follow along. Um, but what we're hoping is that further on down the road that we can maybe develop a kit with clay and tools that you can come and pick up from 171 and bring home so that you can follow along with classes that we, we may be offering. So the next thing that we have going on, there's a live stream with Tony and Gwen on Monday. They're doing a Maypole, because guess what? It's May tomorrow. My goodness. <laughs> so they are going to celebrate May by making their Maypole out at their, uh, their residence out in uh, Hammond's Port and then hopefully we'll have some more clay live streams next week and you'll get to see me, you'll see Martha and our other instructor Kirk who we haven't had live yet so those of you who um, aren't familiar with him can get a chance to see what he does and we're hoping that that then brings us into having classes truly online because um, it, it doesn't seem like we're going to be opening quite so soon. Um, we're not in that first wave of essential businesses quite yet. So um, a lot of our classes are, are trying to switch over to this online format. So those of you who are looking for some classes, hang on, let me turn my camera so you guys can see me. Um, we do have some of them up online. Um, our staff have been working really hard to get all of these things figured out. Our instructors are, are adapting and we're learning new stuff as we go. So the things that are online that you can take um, as a class, kind of like you would at 171, but from the comfort of your own home, is Tai Chi. Um, we have um, yoga classes going up. There's our Reading the Classics group, which is a book club. You can meet together and talk about the book of the month. And then we also have our language classes as online. Those were a little bit easier to translate into that online space. Um, our more material-based classes are a little bit mm, trickier. So um, we're <clears throat> looking into a lot of different possibilities. Um, so those will be forthcoming. Um, keep checking our social media stuff to, to find our latest updates. Facebook's the great place to find it, but of course our website also has things. We have a ceramic show coming up. Um, our very own instructor, Fred Herbst, who's our 
connection up to Corning Community College with our wood kiln that we, we play along with, with him, is jurying a show called The Wheels Are Coming Off. So it's a show focused on hand-built work. So not wheel stuff, but working with clay and building it with just about every other tool except the wheel. That deadline is May 8th. You can still apply for that. Um, it's online in our galleries tab and under the opportunities you can see what that looks like if you want to um, make a submission. Um, that show is going to be in July. It might be switching to a virtual show and, and being online. We're not quite certain on that yet. So check back for, for more details. And um, if you're not seeing this on Facebook, which I think my nine viewers currently are, you can watch this later on. It'll be uploaded, of course, to our Facebook page, but also to our YouTube channel. So it's just 171 Cedar Art Center. You can find our channel and see all of the, the videos that we've done so far for your convenience. If you have somebody who missed the live stream, you can direct them that way too, and they can check it out themselves. Um, so I'm going to just do a little bit more finish work on this. I'll post pictures in the comments feed afterwards so that you guys can see this. Um, and if I get some more detail on the one that I just made, I will post that up as well. Um, let me just check my feed to see if I've missed any comments before I say goodbye. Mm. Do, do, do. Yeah, Sandy, it's just your size for ice cream, but remember, it's going to shrink. <laughs> uh, all right, so I, I don't see any specific questions. If I missed you, I'll, I'll go back and uh, reply in our comments after I post this onto the page after we're done doing our live streaming. So um, I think that's it for now. I will hopefully be seeing you virtually very soon and I hope you're all well um, and hopefully this some this weekend will be a little bit more sunny so we can have some outdoor rec time <laughs> kind of looking forward to that aspect of it so I will see you guys later and thanks for tuning in